Okay. Hey, everyone. My name is William. I work for a company called Particular Software. We write tools that make it easier for developers like you guys uh, to work with distributed systems. Uh, we're probably most well known for N Service Bus. Has anyone heard of N Service Bus? Excellent. Anyone using N Service Bus? That's even better. Uh, I'm not going to be talking about N Service Bus at all today. So there's two reasons why I asked if you are using N Service Bus. Uh, the first is because I'm really bad at making small talks, so that's kind of all I've got. Uh, the second is my colleague, Adam Ralph, is going to be presenting after me in this room, and he's not here right now, and I'm willing to bet that he's going to start the talk exactly the same way. So I'm not saying we shouldn't laugh at him and applaud if he does, but it would be great just to make him a little more uncomfortable when he's speaking. Today we're going to be talking about micro front ends. Um, oh, before we get into that, I am from South Africa, and I do know the South African accent can be a little bit thick and heavy to understand. Uh, so I will try to speak a little bit slower than I usually do, and I will try to enunciate a bit clearer. But if I say something that you don't understand, you can stop me and I'll ignore you. Um, or you can speak to me afterwards, um, and we can go over the stuff again. So we're talking about micro front ends today, and as the title says, we are doing a code-first dive. And what better way to do a code first dive than to start with 35 PowerPoint slides? So we will. Kidding. So there's not 35, but there are a few slides leading up to explain some of the concepts, and then we're going to get into a very demo-heavy talk after that. So bear with me for a little bit. Let's begin at the beginning. And what better beginning than the beginning of the universe, 13.8 billion years ago? The universe was created. And as Douglas Adams says, it made a lot of people very angry and is widely considered a bad move. After the universe was created, we had 13.8 billion years of stuff happen. We had single-cell life happen. We had multi-cell life happen. We had evolution take place. All of this was happening for 13.8 billion years, leading up to one specific date in time. And this date changed everything. The date was the 26th of August, 2006. The date that John Resig finally released jQuery to the world. And this changed the way we did web development. Before jQuery, if you were doing any web development, you had to do a lot of work that was specific for browsers. And if, like me, you didn't actually care about your users, you just put a little thing on the page saying, optimize for Netscape Navigator at 800 by 600. And if they couldn't use a site, too bad. jQuery changed all of that. That meant that you didn't have to write code that was specific for a browser or specific for a resolution. You could write code that could work across many browsers. But if jQuery is so fantastic, why aren't we using it so much today? Who here, yeah, if you start in a brand new system, will go and say, I'm going to use jQuery, and that'll be the foundation of my entire web system? It's kind of a hand there. <laughs> the reason that we're not using jQuery is because we've moved on as an industry. jQuery has become essentially legacy. After jQuery, we had a bunch of other frameworks come around the start of the single-page application era. We had Angular, we had Knockout, Backbone, Durandal, a bunch of other frameworks. But they're also legacy. So how do we, as a, as a developer, how do you choose the right web front-end technology to use now if you expect to still be working on the same system in 10 years? Because everybody doesn't want to use Angular now, or AngularJS now, because they want to use Angular, even though AngularJS was originally called Angular but then Google changed the name, because what does a search engine know about making things searchable? You want to use Angular or Vue or React or any of the cool new frameworks now, but in a few years' time, maybe you want to use Unicorn.js or Pillowfight.js or whatever the next cool framework is going to be. So we need a way to future-proof our systems now. And as an industry, we've actually come up with a pretty good way of being able to get different technologies to work together towards one common aim. And that's in microservices. Each microservice can, in, a, in theory, run its own technology stack. And that can work together to allow a distributed system to achieve some business capability as a whole. And maybe there's some lessons we can take from how microservices do this and apply it on the front end so that we can have different technologies working together on the front end to achieve, to achieve a single goal. And obviously, you're here and I'm talking, so yes, we can. Um, and that's known as composite UI or micro front ends. And there's a whole lot of techniques to be able to achieve this. So we're going to be talking about a few of those today. 
Before we get into that, let's just do a quick primer on microservices. So this is a great example. I've seen it a couple of times uh, this week already. There's four little different services there. The one does shipping, the one does checkout, the one does invoice generation and billing. And this is great. You see this all the time and you think, microservices are really easy. We can do this. We'll just have a service for order generation and everything's fine. And they communicate via messaging, which, well, that's what you do. You can throw RabbitMQ down or SQS and everything's fine. You're doing microservices. But this only works in PowerPoint presentations. In real life, it gets a lot more messy because as developers, you do microservices. We tend to think, well, I need to do microservices. If I'm, if I'm adding another piece of functionality that isn't exactly billing but has some kind of relationship, I will just put another service down. It's micro. It's fine. So you end up with a bit more of a mess and a bit more communication between the different services. But also in real life, it's never quite as pretty as this. You've also always got some type of dependency on a monolith that a lot of services seem to have to interact with. But it's never just a monolith that looks complete and shiny like that. It's always a half-incomplete monolith that's even bigger and has a bunch of external dependencies in order to actually work. So you've got very brittle chains of dependencies in real life with microservices. On top of this, because we're microservicing, we're doing Docker and we're shipping everything via Docker into production, right? That makes sense. Except what we haven't realized is we've actually just shipped Daniel's workstation into production because we didn't get the configuration of Docker right. But that's also totally fine because he's got a pretty powerful workstation, so he probably doesn't even notice. But we're microservicing. The thing with this is that the problems around this and the complexity around this are not a technological issue. There's no technology that would have made this better. If you had chosen Kafka over RabbitMQ, you'd still end up in a similar situation. Well, it might look a bit different, but things get messy when you're doing it with microservices. And almost always, it's because we've chosen the wrong boundaries for our services. So the talk straight after this one, hopefully Adam actually makes it here, um, he's got an entire talk around finding the right service boundaries. And if you find the right service boundaries, you can avoid a lot of this confusion. And having the right service boundaries means that when you're generating your UI, the pieces where the, that UI comes from is a lot easier to deal with as well. So I'm not going to talk much more about service boundaries for, for the rest of the talk. Hopefully Adam does make it, and hopefully you stay for his talk as well. Uh, because it, it's probably one of the key things that makes microservices actually work, is having the right service boundaries. So today we are going to be going through a few techniques to do micro front ends. Um, and each technique forms part of a spectrum. It's not that one technique is better than another technique. It's in some environments it makes more sense to use one technique over another. And in other environments, maybe you'll combine different techniques together. So it's a spectrum that we're going to be looking at. And the demos we're going to take a look at is we're first going to start with complete isolation between frameworks. Then we're going to look at the Spotify approach, which really does need a catchy name because type in Spotify all the time just gets annoying. We're then going to change and look at componentization and then extend that into web components and then see how, if we can get multiple frameworks running in the same page at the same time. So that's all we're going to cover today. And without wasting any further time, let's have a look at isolation and let's get into some demos. So this is a .NET application. It's the ASP.NET MVC Music Store. Um, there's nothing really fancy about it. You can go and you can uh, browse into an album, maybe add it to your cart, and then you can check out, and that's pretty cool. Great system. Let's assume that we are the developers working on the system, and the product manager has an idea. So we're sitting at our desk, product manager comes, knocks on the door, although we're all working in open plan hot swap desks these days, so there's no door, and the product owner comes in and has to spend five minutes trying to find us in our hot swap desk today, because that's super productive. So the product owner finds us, uh, we're sitting with our headphones on, we kind of just see this awkward shadow standing next to us, pull the headphone to the side, and the product owner says, I have an idea for a feature. Now, any good developer knows that when someone says, I have a good idea for a feature, the appropriate response is, Headphones off, back on the table. You stand up from your chair. You lie down on the ground, and you get in the fetal position, and you start grading yourself because you know it's always going to be a lot of work and a bad idea. So you're lying on the floor. The product owner is looking over you saying, I think we should implement one-click checkout, similar to how Amazon does it. 
And while you're lying there, you hate to admit it, but that is actually a pretty good idea for the system because this checkout form is ugly. So you start thinking about how you would do this. Well, we need, we need to store the postal address. We need to store some information about the billing address. Uh, we need to store the credit card information. Uh oh. As soon as you start dealing with credit card information, you now have, your system has to be PCI compliant. On top of that, you're storing personal information, so you have to be GDPR compliant, because we're in Europe, I suppose. So suddenly, something that should be a quick little add a button on the form and save some fields to a database becomes a 13, 14-month project, because you've got to change your entire system to be compliant. And in the microservices space, a good approach here is to carve that functionality off into a completely separate application that can be PCI compliant on its own without having to affect the rest of the system. So the checkout process becomes its own service that runs, and it just handles the checkout and the PCI compliance and everything else that has to happen around that and feeds the results back into the main system. Now, I don't know about you, but some of the best times I have a soft, as a software developer is when I can start in a brand new project. So this is a great example of where you can go and start in a brand new project, use whatever cool new technology you want, and then after six months leave and leave someone else to support your learning exercise. And so that's what we're going to do now. We're going to take this .NET application and we're going to start a new one, or well, not a new .NET application, we're going to start a Node.js with Express application. And this Express application is going to do our Express checkout. Because it's Express and it's a... Well, if, you, if you don't think that's funny, you're in for a whole lot more of non-funny jokes. So this is a, a typical Express application. The only thing I've done, so I've scaffolded out an Express application, and I've added a checkout router um, and added that to the checkout route, obviously. And all that this checkout router does is it goes and loads information from your cart and displays it on the screen and has a button that says confirm. The way that this looks is when you browse to this page, it looks like this. So you've got the Express checkout, some information about, I don't know if you can even, yeah, that's fine, um, about the order that you've got, and then a confirm purchase button. Okay, but how do we get this into our main application? How does that workflow exist? So the last thing I'm going to say about service boundaries is that this is a really good point where the service boundaries have to be clearly defined. If the cart or if the, the actual e-commerce application has to send messages to your checkout process to say this item is in the cart with this quantity and things like that, um, you, may be having, or you may have a leaky abstraction between your boundaries there. So there, there's some clever ways that those messages must be defined so that you don't get that leaky bounded context. Um, Adam will hopefully cover those for you. So the easiest way that we can get this application into our main application um, is to, well... If I, instead of clicking on the checkout button and I get redirected to that uh, controller, why don't I change the code so that um, instead of going there, I just go to the new page. So href equals, and I'll put the localhost in because it's running on a separate port. 3000, checkout. We maybe give it a cart ID if we really want, whatever. So if I reload the page and we click the checkout, we now get redirected to a new application. If the person clicks confirm purchase, essentially the workflow could redirect us back. And yes, this is not micro front ends. This is a complete cheat. But let's just examine this for a second. We've taken a piece of functionality, extracted it to its own back end service, which has its own front end component as well. The interaction between the two is via messaging, so we've got nice separation between the two different systems. On the front end side, what we've done is we've taken a front end from the one system and just redirect it to the other system, and once the payment's done there, it might redirect back. Yeah, that's pretty horrible. But the precedent is set. For instance, if you browse on Amazon, you get a view that looks like this. You've got some Chrome at the top with the header information. You've got your recently viewed items on the side. Uh, the footer's got some details. As soon as you click the checkout button, you've got a completely different experience. The Chrome at the top is gone, the foot is completely different. The side information is different. So if you've ever got a user that's, work or that's ordered anything off of Amazon, they've probably been through a similar experience. If you've ever bought anything on the internet and you've been redirected to a payment gateway, 
and then redirect it back to your original e-commerce site, it's exactly the same thing. In some situations, it makes sense to do a complete context switch and come back. And it's not micro front ends. I'll agree with you 100% there. Let's look at some pros and cons of doing this type of technique. So in terms of isolation, you've got complete technology isolation. You've got .NET on the one side and Express on the other, or Node on the other side. You've got deployment or release isolation. You can, you can release that checkout process six times an hour and have the main .NET application only get on a strict release schedule of once every six months. There's complete isolation between them. Runtime isolation is also complete there. And you can get some really fast load times between the systems. Because when you get directed to the checkout application, it's just loading information for checking out. It's not loading 13 other JavaScript libraries that you happen to require for the one screen in your site that's got a tree view. Cache management is also really easy here because it doesn't matter if you've got version 15 of a particular library on the main site and version 16 on, another, on your checkout process. They're completely isolated. So managing the cache between these two is very easy. On the downside, there's no code reuse, which if you're trying to reuse my code is probably a good thing, but if you're trying to reuse your code, maybe you do want to do some code reuse there. There's also no shared brand and identity. The styling between the two different sites is completely different. And from a user experience perspective, transferring from one site to the other site is pretty ugly as well. We can improve some of this. So we can do something like server-side includes, um, where we just include fragments from other pieces of functionality. Um, if you're using .NET, you might be using one of the Razor View engines or one of the other MVC engines. Um, you can just include partials. That'll be easy enough. But pretty much any web server that you use has a way of doing server-side includes um, that you can bundle bits of functionality in. So we can include a nav bar at the top. We can include a footer at the bottom, a user profile. We can do some styling. What this does to the pros and cons, though, is that it make, makes the cache management a little more difficult because you've now got, you can share dependencies between the different server side includes. So you might have version 14 and version 15 trying to load at the same time. You can get slow load times uh, because before the page gets sent down to the browser, the whole thing has to be rendered first. So each of the server side includes, depending on how long they take to render, could slow the whole page down. But we get a slightly better brand identity there. Still not really a great user experience, though. Although you can make it that you don't really notice. We can improve this a bit more, though. So let's take a look at the Spotify approach. Has anyone read the Spotify Squad framework? OK, there's a few of you. So in the keynote yesterday, uh, we were told, don't just adopt the Spotify approach. Correct, read it, see what works for you, and, and apply what doesn't, ignore what doesn't. But that's not what this talk is about. So essentially, what the Spotify uh, squad framework says is that each feature within Spotify is owned by a squad. And that's completely owned from the, from the requirements to the design to the technology choice, from the implementation of the back end to the front end. Everything is owned by that squad. By extension, that means that they can choose different technology to all the previous squads for that feature. And of particular interest to this talk is the desktop application, the Spotify desktop application. So the Spotify desktop application is a C++ application that hosts about a million iframes. So hopefully you'll be seeing, you should have an idea of where I'm going with this. So if instead of checking out, taking us to the checkout page, uh, let me just undo that. Copy so I don't have to retype it. Undo all of that. We'll get, we'll take, We'll redirect back to the main checkout controller again, but instead of displaying this horrible form, we'll comment this out, and we'll stick an iframe on the page. Um, checkout, I just need to put the URL in. I cannot type. Who likes seeing me do live coding, even though this isn't coding? Okay. So we can now go to the checkout process, and we get an iframe here, and apparently I've got the wrong port number, 30,000. And we get an iframe over here. And that looks pretty bad, but we can style it so that maybe you don't even notice. So we can do things like we'll set the border to none. Uh, we'll set the width to 100% so it takes up the full page, not windows. Um, and we'll set the height somewhere useful so we can actually see it as well. Now when the user comes to this page, it's an iframe, and that's horrible. 
But from the user's perspective, they might not even notice if the latency is low enough. And that's important. If you've got five or six different iframes on a page, remember those iframes are only going to be loaded once your main page is loaded. But it's a technique you can use to bring a system that's hosted somewhere else into your main system. Again, it's still cheating. If we look at some pros and cons of doing embedding in this manner, so you've still got complete technology isolation, deployment isolation, and runtime isolation, uh, but the, the load time will suffer because unlike the Spotify desktop application, which is all in one process, it's not doing any network calls to load those iframes, uh, this is going to go over a network most likely, uh, which is going to involve HTTP stacks, loading things, sending back, processing, displaying. So it, it is going to affect your load time on your page. Cache management is still easy because the way our frames work, it's completely separate from the main page anyway, so it's different versions of the libraries in the same application. You still don't get code reuse, but you do get a very nice branding identity and a shared or a smooth user experience as well. So we've taken a look at two ways of doing really hacky micro front ends. I, I hesitate to even call it that. It's just having a front end somewhere else and being able to display it in our main front end. I bet you that's not what anyone is here is for. Is here for. You swear English wasn't my first language. So let's switch tacks and let's take a look at componentizing things. So by componentizing, we're obviously talking about breaking things up into smaller pieces and being able to run those. So we're done with our Express demo, um, and we're now going to look at a tourism site called Tourism. So this is a system where you can search for flights, um, car rentals, hotel bookings. Um, and this system is written using Angular, and again, Express for the back end. The important part here is that on, on the system, the main page over here is comprised predominantly of React components. So this portion over here, ooh, that button over there, the flights button, comes from the flights module. And this component over here, where you actually type in where you want to go, the check-in date and the check-out date, comes from the flights module. So these components come from a module that is only responsible for dealing with flights. And when you click the search for flights button, that component knows how to talk to its back end directly. It doesn't have to talk via a broker or a gateway or anything like that which means that if the back end changes, the component needs to change as also it knows to talk to a different back end. Or if the front end changes, the component doesn't affect anyone else. So for instance, the fields over here, where, check in, check out, are probably more applicable to a hotel instead of a flight. So maybe they want to change that. So all of these come from different components within the system. In React, the way that this is implemented, this one over here, so here's my main application. Uh, let me just scroll up a little bit. There we go. So over here, we've got uh, the modules that have been imported, car, hotel, and flight. And we simply display them as the nav button gets displayed there and the flight control gets displayed there. To implement these in React, um, it's pretty much the first thing you learn when you do React. You create components and you export them at the bottom of your module. That's it. But this is all in the same application. This is all, everything's in React in the same application. And that's, again, not a particularly great demo. So this tourism site is doing really, really well. So well, in fact, that they bought a system that allows people to search for cruises. Now, the cruises application is written in Angular. And it's got an entire back end of its own. It's got its entire front end. You can log in. Uh, if, you, if you've booked a cruise, you can log in. It will show you where your cruise is going. So this is one from Gdansk to somewhere, St. Petersburg. Um, and you can see the weather patterns if it's, if it's applicable. Um, and you can see, you can click on the different ports where you're going to stop and see points of interest for the dates that you're there. And customers really like this. So you're sitting at your desk because you work on this system. And the product owner comes to you and says, I have an idea for a feature. So you assume the position on the floor, cradling yourself. And while you're there, the product owner says, it'd be really nice if our users could search for a cruise on our main site. We get a lot more traffic than the cruise site. So we want to be able to expose that search functionality. Now, these two systems, again, are completely separate. They've got completely different technology. And they're actually hosted in completely different repositories as well. 
So we need a way of creating a control that's going to be displayed here that says cruisers and then has a separate display at the bottom over here specific to searching for cruisers. So our Angular application is this one over here. So you can see here's my package JSON. All of the dependencies are Angular. By the way, is anyone using Angular CLI? Oh, you have my sympathy. Um, and we need to find a way to get this Angular application to work within our React application. So let's take a step back and think about how microservices would do this, or in the SOA space, how you would achieve this. If you were working in a microservice system and you had multiple front ends that you had to develop as part of one service boundary, you would have different teams to implement those different technologies. You would have the skills within your team to be able to build an Angular front end, Angular, an Android front end and an iOS front end, as well as a web front end, if necessary. That concept can be extended to this example over here as well. So we've got a code base over here that's written in Angular, but it forms part of one bounded context. It's cruises in this scenario. If we assume that we want to host this in an Angular application, an Android application, you can see what I've got in my mind. If we want to host this in an Android application, we would have to have an Android developer sitting on the team to be able to implement the control that's going to be displayed within Android. The same thing applies here. So we'll start by having a capability to create a React component from our Angular application so that we can host that in our React system. Now, the important difference is the dependencies, the runtime dependencies for the system are Angular. The dev dependencies, I've included React. Okay, so React is a development time dependency only. Um, and I'll explain why that's important just now. So now that I've imported React, I can use it during development time which means that I can take, I can create a React or a set of React components, cruisers and a cruise nav button that can be exported from this application and imported into the main application. So I've done exactly the same as we did in the actual tourers application. We've got a cruise component or a cruise nav button component and a cruise component that exposes their own uh, functionality. Now that we've got a React or set of React components, we need to bundle that up together so that we can export it and so that it can be imported. So to do that, we're going to use Webpack. Um, and Webpack, uh, let's go to find the file here. Uh, the Webpack, all I've done is I've gone and included another module. So I've defined another module. So we've got our index module, which is for the main Angular application. And then on top of that, I've got a cruises uh, application, which has got my cruise controls. Cruise controls in here. Oh, come on. <laughs> so the cruise controls is going to have that module that's our React component exported. So if I build this, what we end up with is a build static JS cruises file over here. And you don't actually have to read the contents of the file. But this is the Webpack built version of my React file over here. So it's gone and converted everything from JSX into JavaScript modules. It's minified everything and put it all in one file for us. There's also a source mapping file if we so want. But how do we get this into our main application? OK, we've, we've got a React component. We need to export that somehow. So package.json, or npm, sorry, is a, is a great repository manager, or package manager, because you can add an npm reference to just about anything. You can add an npm reference to a package on the npm repository. You can add an npm reference to a GitHub repository, a branch within a GitHub repository, a source folder, a network share, your own npm repository, whatever you want, there's pretty much a way to add an npm reference to it. So this particular file that we've built now is checked into my codes repository, and it's been pushed up to GitHub. If I add a reference to this GitHub repository via NPM, it's going to go and download all of the files in the repository for me, which I don't want. I don't want the entire source code to come down as part of the package, because then you end up with those node modules folders that are megabytes big. So in our package.json, you can specify there's a main property over here, which is the entry file that gets loaded. And then there's also a files property, which is an array. And you can specify which files must get pulled down as part of this package. So in my Angular application, I've told 
NPM that if someone installs this repository or this folder or this package, these are the files that you must get. And the first one there is this cruises file that has been built by Webpack for me. Which means that if I go back to the Angular application and I add a reference to my, which I have if you see here, to my GitHub repository, this is my micro front ends cruises, which is basically just a repository on GitHub. And if I find the micro front ends package in my node modules, you'll see that one of the files that's downloaded is the build static JS cruises file, which is that React component. So one application has created the component and said that this component must be exported and another application can import that. Now that I've imported it within my React application, I can simply import from that package. So we'll do a import cruise and cruise nav button from, and instead of importing from a JavaScript file like we normally do there, we would say from micro front ends cruises because we're importing from a package now. And to display it, uh, similar thing, so it's cruise, I'm just going to copy paste, cruise nav button, and let me copy paste this guy over here. Uh, this is cruises, cruise, and if I reload the page, hopefully there's going to be a cruise button over here, although knowing my luck, it's probably going to stop. What is it doing? Come on. Resolving host, waiting for Google APIs. Oh, goody. There we go. And the font's not loading. Right, so now we've got a cruises button that's been defined in our Angular application. But that's also not micro front ends. That's not what anyone here is interested in seeing. Because all we've done is we've taken the same technology and put the dependency of it on some other system, some other stack. So let's look at the pros and cons of doing this way, and we'll see if we can improve that. So there's no technology isolation, because if my main application is using React 15, the component that, or the, the application that exports that component also has to use React 15, or it has to ensure that 15 and 16 are compatible with the features that I'm using. There's only partial deployment isolation, because the Cruises application can publish updates to its uh, React component as often as it wants, but it's only going to be updated on the front end when the main application pulls that dependency or updates that dependency and deploys it. There's no runtime isolation here, and you can get really slow load times depending on what you build into your component. So if that uh, React component had a whole bunch of JavaScript dependencies that had to be bundled as part of it, that would form part of the package size which would then get imported into the main one, which all eventually ends up getting downloaded to the browser. But in terms of cache management, it's fairly easy uh, because it's just, as long as you keep the versions between the packages the same, it's okay. You've got one system that's deploying. You can still use a CDN for React 16 if that's what you're into. Code reuse is pretty good because you're essentially, well, it's not, it's not good from the system that has to create the component side, but from the system that consumes it, it's fairly good because it's just adding on to the same functionality that's already there. And from a user perspective, there's great branding um, and the experience is pretty nice. Let's see if we can extend this though, and we'll look at web components. So let's see if we can get rid of that, some of those technology dependencies there. So instead of mucking about with trying to get um, a, a control look the same over here. Well, how about we just take this uh, application that's got the map control over here and deploy it straight in our React application? So let's have a look at how we would do that. Our Angular application has got a map control component, uh, which is an Angular component, and it's got inside of itself, it's just got a heading and an XMAP, which itself is another Angular component. The component itself is defined using uh, the component attribute, and it's got some behavior and some stuff happens and whatever. So this is an Angular component, similar to the React components that we saw earlier. How do we export this as a web component? How do we convert this component into a web component? And each, each framework that you use has got slightly different ways of doing this. React has its own way of, of wrapping React components as web components. Vue has the same, Ember. So the way you do it in Angular um, is you add a package reference to Angular elements. 
So angular elements is the piece that is kind of going to bind everything together. On the component itself, there's very little you have to change. The only thing you have to add is this encapsulation. You must set it to view encapsulation.native. So this is going to allow for the web component to exist within the shadow DOM. Um, so I'm not going to explain what web components are or some of the big features around them. I'm just assuming that everyone knows them. What... So by specifying the view, encapsulation to be view encapsulation to be native, it means that it's going to exist within the shadow DOM in the browser, which means it can't impact other elements on the page. And that's all you have to do on the component side. The next thing you have to do is, because we're using the horrible Angular CLI, we have to muck about with the um, app module. So on the app module, uh, you have to import the create custom element from Angular Elements, because that's what's actually going to bundle everything for us. Um, and then on the uh, entry components, we have to add our map control, or the component that you want to expose. We have to add that to the entry point, because Otherwise, the Angular builder doesn't know that it has to also start with that. Otherwise, it's going to build your entire application as part of a web component, which you don't really want. Once you've done that, um, in the actual code, in the ng bootstrap method, we call that create custom element method. So this method comes from Angular elements, remember. And we say that this element that we get, it must define the map control HTML fragment. Um, so that means when we want to use this, we will go map-control in HTML, and that will be our web component that's going to render based off of this. So now when we run ng-build, um, the CLR is going to go and it's going to package everything for us. We're going to get our main application, and because we've got a separate entry point for our map control, we're going to get a separate map control application. Um, the current CLI does a horrible job of building or binding everything together. So if I just show you the package JSON here, um, I do also have an extra step that just goes and runs a component.build JavaScript file. And all this component build does is it takes the output for this web component and combines it into one single file. You didn't have to do this in Angular 4. You do now in Angular 6 because progress. Um, okay, so after this, we have got a file generated for us, uh, which is this. It is our map component, map control. And this is what a web component looks like uh, if it's generated via Angular and Angular elements. It's pretty messy. Everything has been combined. What's important, though, is all of the dependencies for this control have been included in this one file. So all we have to do is include this file in our main application. So the same way how, as we exported that React component, so in the package JSON, uh, I've also not that one, uh, that one. I've also said that the other file that must get downloaded is the map control file. So when you npm reference to this repository, it'll bring that file down as well. And that means in our cruise application, uh, because I've already added um, the npm or the node modules directory over here. You can see there's my map, my component, and my map control module over here that's been downloaded, which means in my main application, if I want to display this, let's just stick it right at the top here. We'll do a map control as an HTML element. Obviously, if, if we just render this, the browser's not going to know what I'm talking about. Um, so we need to include the JavaScript that, that uh, was actually bundled for us. Um, and we'll just do this over here. And I'm going to do the, the source from the node modules directory, uh, but typically your build process would uh, take your node module dependencies and include it as part of your system.js or whatever dependency resolver you're using. And by doing that, so now I've included the JavaScript file and I've put the HTML fragment down. If I reload the page, and hopefully it doesn't take forever this time to refresh, but who knows. Um, if I reload the page and when it eventually does reload, I don't understand what it's trying to do on the internet. Uh, we should see the map control at the top and then the React um, application kind of around it once it loads at some point. Oh, it's the Google fonts. That's what it is. That's what it's trying to do off the internet. There we go. Okay, so there's our cruise application. It's busy loading the, the map component over there. Um, and there's our React application that sits in process. Um, this heading, by the way, comes from the uh, the map control. So once it eventually loads the 
uh, fonts for the map that should display. Hopefully by the time we all tab back, it'll be there. So with web components, they sound really cool, um, but there's a bunch of pros and cons around them as well. You do get technology isolation because you can take your Angular functionality, wrap it in a web component, and host it within a React application or within a knockout application or just a normal HTML application. It doesn't matter. There's full runtime isolation because of the shadow DOM. Whatever you do to styles or JavaScript within your web component cannot impact anything else on the page. But there's no deployment isolation because you still have to pull that package into the main application and update the reference that way. You do get very slow load times because that file that is generated is this one over here. It's the map con control which is 400 kilobytes big for one little control that gets displayed. Which means if you've got three or four different web components, because every web component is isolated from every other web component, all of the dependencies are going to be built into that one component. Which means you're going to download Angular three or four times if you're doing three or four Angular components on the same page. Cache management is horrendous with this as well. Again, because everything gets bundled into the same file, if you change a equal sign to a greater than or equal sign, guess what? You've got to download that entire 400 kilobyte dependency again. So cache management is really difficult with this. But you do get really good code reuse, and the experience is very nice from the user's perspective. Let's take a look at multiple frameworks. Has anyone, anyone been to South Africa, by the way? Oh, no one. Ah, oh, one. Excellent. So we've got these minibus taxis in South Africa, and they're supposed to fit 16 people in, uh, but it, it seems to be a personal challenge for all of the taxi drivers to fit between 20 and 25 people in one of these. And that's kind of representative of what we're going to try to do here. Um, so there is a library called Single Spa, which stands for Single Single Page Application, and, and yes, they're well aware that it's a uh, duplicate. Um, but what it allows you to do is you can uh, host, for instance, this is a React application, this middle portion is AngularJS, and the bottom portion is Angular. So you can host multiple frameworks within the page at one time. And the way that it typically does this is it looks at the route that you're at, so in this case we're AngularJS, and based off of that, it knows which modules it must bootstrap, mount, and unmount. I'm not going to show much about this because I want to show something else that they've introduced. So recently, the Single Spire Framework has in introduced what they call a parcel. And a parcel is kind of a gap between a web component and a component. And we're going to take a look at that. If you want to spend more time with Single Spire, the link is in my slide at the slides at the end. So this is an insurance company that does crypto machine learning insurance, because that's cool now. Um, and you can add different covers to your policy. So you can add a uh, vehicle cover, you can add household insurance, all risk cover, oh, household contents insurance, or all risk cover. And uh, hmm. So this application is written using Angular again, but this component over here is written using Vue. And it's not a web component in this case. This is built using the single spy parcel framework, and this is fully functional, so you can type and do whatever you want. Um, but that's not really interesting. So, how does this look? So here's my insurance application, and this is what the Angular component looks like for the main page. It's got a bunch of buttons. When you click a button, it opens up a modal dialog. Completely uninteresting. When you click the All Risk cover, though, what it does is it pops up a dialog that inside of it has a parcel component. Okay, so the parcel component is what's going to do the view, bootstrapping, and mounting for us. The parcel component is a uh, Angular component, which just has some markup inside of it, which you don't see anywhere on the main application because single spa goes and removes that and replaces it with the um, actual parcel that's been run. To invoke that, um, so this is the component, the Angular component for the parcel component. This gets very complicated because there's so many components here. Um, but this parcel has a dependency on view. It also has a dependency on single spa view because single spa is going to do all of the encapsulation for us. And when this component initializes, we create what's known as a life cycle for view. And this comes from the single spa view object. So the life cycle, single spa needs three events. It needs bootstrap, mount, and unmount. 
so that it knows when I want to when I know I'm going to use this module, this is how I bootstrap everything. When it has to get displayed, this is what I must do to mount it into the DOM. And when, it, when you navigate away, uh, this is what I must do to remove it from the DOM. So those are the three important lifecycle events. And this single spy view, which comes from the single spy view package, does all of that for you. Then you've got the app options, and this is pretty much just a view component. I've got some computed properties on there. I've got some filters on there. Um, whatever attributes you need to pass into your view component. Instead of doing markup inline like this, you might want to use a template URL and point it to a .view file. You know, whatever you want. So we've got our view lifecycles object, which has got a reference to our view component. Uh, we then get the DOM element that we want to replace. Uh, we set whatever properties we need on that object, so whatever data needs to get passed from our application into the view component. So from our Angular application, what information do we have to provide to view? Um, and then we just call mount root parcel. And mount root parcel comes from single spar. And then single spar goes and says, okay, well, I've got this lifecycle that I want to load. Because this lifecycle is a view lifecycle, I know I need to go and get these view components, mount them into memory, then take those components, put it into the DOM, and everything just kind of works around that. And that's sort of what it looks like. So this entire application is Angular with a view component here. The difference between this and web components is in terms of the size. So that view component that I've defined in line over here, that can also come from a separate application but the dependencies around it won't be bundled within the same file. So if I've got three or four different Angular components that I want to host within my React application, instead of bundling all of the dependencies with that, if you use the parcel approach, you bundle just what that component needs outside of the bigger dependencies because those big dependencies are managed by single spa. So if you look at the pros and cons of this. So you've got complete, again, technical technology isolation. You can use whatever technology you want. Um, and when you bundle that together, when you package it, single spa takes care of loading those dependent frameworks. There isn't deployment isolation. There isn't runtime isolation. It can get very slow depending on how many of these frameworks you're trying to load. Um, when I showed you the single spa demo over here, uh, that one, I had preloaded this page because in the background, it's going to initialize in three different frameworks. It, it does take a while. So it can get very, very slow. That should say slow load times, not fast. Cache management is, again, it gets a bit complicated because the dependencies you've got, again, become shared. Um, if you've written a component using React 15 and you, the main site is using React 16, because there's no encapsulation of those dependencies, uh, you need to worry about the different versions there but you get some pretty cool code reuse, and the branding experience is nice again. So let's do a quick 30-second recap of what we've done. We started off by cheating very badly and just saying, well, if you click a button, go to a different system and then come back. Not micro front ends, really. We then took a look at using iframes to stick things within the same application. Again, not really micro front ends, but both of these are useful techniques. We also then took, took a look at uh, web components taking something within a framework and hosting it in a different framework completely within its own encapsulated shadow DOM. Uh, we looked at components sort of on their own without any real technology isolation, so just exporting components from one system and importing them into another. We looked at single spa, which allows you to have multiple frameworks running at the same time, if that's what you're interested in. Um, and then we took a look at parcels so that we could have a sort of mix between uh, components and web components with slightly smaller file sizes. And what you'll kind of see is that there seems to be two major themes coming through here. You're either hosting things separately and bringing them in at runtime, or you're developing them separately and shipping them at deploy time together. And that, no matter how, which technique you use, there's a whole lot of other techniques um, besides the ones that I've shown you today. No matter what techniques you're using, it's probably going to fall in either one of those scenarios. And from the microservices space, that makes sense, because you either have functionality completely deployed separately, or you've got that functionality developed separately, but hosted logically in a different environment. And that's why there's always a big debate between, well, is it physically separate or is it logically separate? And that same thing applies over here. 
Each implementation has its own set of pros and cons, um, and you need to choose which one fits your environment, which technique works best for you. There's no real perfect answer. Um, some required reading, finding your service boundaries is a talk, hopefully, that will be happening soon. I don't know if I haven't seen him walk in. Um, if he hasn't walked in, you can find a recording of that talk on Vimeo there. Uh, single spa, if you want to learn something, I don't necessarily think it's always applicable, uh, but the library is there. And then Mozilla's documentation on web components is fantastic. And then all of the code for the demos here, you can see in these two repositories on my site, or on my profile. And that's it. I'm out of time, so I don't think I have time for questions, uh, but you're welcome to come down. I can give you free water. Thank you. <laughs>